Welcome to Podcasts Across Worlds. I'm your host, Lehua Superfina. And I'm the co-host, Spirit, aka Papa Fulu. We are people who like to read a lot of manga and watch a lot of anime. We realize that we all like similar titles and we could talk about them for hours. So here we are in Podcasts Across Worlds to talk about anime, manga, and everything else we're interested in. I like how you message me on Discord. So, Violet Evergarden. <laughs> Usually when people say that, it's like, let's talk about this now. <laughs> well, yeah, I wasn't expecting to be fucking boiling out. My eyes are. When I suggested that title to you and when you saw it, what did you expect? Yeah, I was expecting, well, I've never even read much about it. I know my dad watched it. And every time I've seen it, I just saw it as, oh, it's going to be like a period drama. Wait, kind of look, have you ever seen Darker Than Black? No, I haven't. What is that about? Oh, that's like kind of like a time travel detective show. Hmm. It's got different time periods, but one of them's like in a Victorian time. I was expecting it to be like that. Hmm. Where it was just going to be like... Uh, Kind of like a shoujo maid type show. I thought it was going to be a shoujo too. It, it, it kind of was, but it was a bit more um, dramatic and dark. Kind of, kind of, kind of not. Kind of. Kind of. It wasn't like dark, dark, but you yes, knew what I mean. Yes, it was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Why do you think so? <laughs> You've got a little girl that's killing people who's used as a fucking tool. And <laughs> she's got no emotion. Have you ever seen the movie Soldier? Yeah, yeah. It's like that, where they only know war. And when you take them out of a situation where it isn't that, they don't know how to comprehend with it. Like, her entire journey is wondering what it, the major meant when he said I love you well in the beginning it did seem like it was going to be that dark but as you watch more episodes they reveal what happened to Violet why she was there how she was picked up like her her life was sad until you know she lost the major <laughs> Which that which is that is sad, um. But that's when her life, she was able to restart. Unfortunately, it was after the major was gone. Could you even say restart? Yes, I I've been saying restart. No, I'm just saying. Could you even say restart? Because would you say our lives restart, or would you say it's actually begun? Begun, yes, begun. Like her life actually begun because she didn't really have a life before. No, her br uh, the major's brother. As he said, he discarded a tool and gave it to his brother and didn't expect his brother to have any feelings towards what is essentially a weapon. Like, kept referring to her as the Major's dog. Yes, yes, that was her nickname. And the doll of the battlefield. So viewers, uh, listeners, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about Violet Evergarden which is an anime that's aired on Netflix. Uh, Spirit, where did you find it if you didn't find it on Netflix? I found it on Netflix. Oh, you did? Okay, it was also on your in your region too. Cool. Yes, and, she's uh, also on the UK <laughs> version of Netflix. <laughs> uh, so Violet, she's called a war doll, right? War doll? Uh, they called her the doll of the battlefield or the doll of Linden shelled. And they were fighting World War Two. I don't know if it was World War Two. It was, but it was a war because it was set in its own, like, world type thing. Like it's got its own war and all countries and all that. But it was a war that would be similar to maybe World War One and World War Two. Look like more like World War One because I didn't see that many planes in that. Uh, well, in that you didn't show? see much of planes other than at the very end where it showed you the air show where it dropped the letters, ah, I and think also was... that postal guy who delivered her to the battlefield. 
Ah, uh, okay, okay. I think it's similar to World War One. So it's similar to World War One, and the first episode is her waking up in the hospital, and she's missing her arm. Is there her arms. arm? Arms. She's missing her arms, and you like see that she has like mechanical arms, and you're like, "WTF? What happened?" And all she's asking is like, "Where's the major? Where is he?" And you're like, "Oh, what happened well, to not, her?" That's not even the first time you notice that she's missing her arms because when she wakes up, the bandaged. And that's right. The only time that you find out is when Hodgson takes her to the. Evergarden house and tea spilt on her arms and the older woman's like oh no you'll burn yourself careful and she's like oh well I can't feel anything and that's when the bandages come off and you see that she's got mechanical arms that it's kind of similar to Edward Elric's auto male arm in Full Metal Alchemist mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so that's the first one or two episodes and later on we learned that she fought in a war she was, uh, what do you call those kids that were taken and then trained to be soldiers? She uh, was child one... soldier. She was a, or, or a child soldier, also a war orphan. Yeah, so she basically was a war orphan, and then she was somehow acquired, and then she was given to this man. And he was a little bit more compassionate. And yes, he used her for battles, but he also developed... Um, feelings for her and you don't really know what their relationship until you watch throughout the show like they show little by little which i liked i like that that they're like revealing a little bit more to their relationship and to violet's past Mm -hmm. but mostly in the show we're seeing her after the battle post-war and how she's trying to adapt to it well she doesn't believe she has any emotions or she doesn't understand emotions. She does. And she did her, not understand them. She's like, what's that? Like, oh. Her whole story is trying to figure out what Aisteru or I love you means. Like, She doesn't understand this. She's never been told this. And another scene that's very similar is when she finds the emerald brooch when the mage is asking, so what would you like me to get you? She's like, what do you mean? Well, I want to get you a gift. Well, what would I want as a gift? Uh, well, a girl your age would want dresses or accessories. Very well, then. I want dresses or accessories. It, he's trying to explain this sort of situation to her, and all of a sudden, when they're walking down kind of like a market, they go past a jewelry-type store, and the major continues walking and t- turns around and notices Violet staring at this emerald brooch. And the reason she likes it is because it's the same color as the mage's eyes. And she goes, this old woman goes, oh, it's very beautiful, isn't it? And Violet says, like, what's beautiful? Aww. Is it the same as pretty? And she goes, yeah, it's the same thing. And the mage goes, wouldn't you want the one that's more like your eyes? And she goes, no, it reminds me of your eyes. And when I'm looking at it, I feel something inside and you see a clutch of chest. And it's her knowing she has feelings for him, but not knowing at the same time. She doesn't understand what her feelings are. Yeah, because she was a child soldier. She doesn't know what emotions are. She All she knows is what she was taught. And when you see her going through a journey of becoming a auto memory doll, which is a person who can write letters because... People can read what they can't write, which I find weird. But yeah, only certain people can <laughs> write, know how to write letters. And an auto memory doll is a person who can use a typewriter and type letters for people and also interpret their emotions and put them into feelings. But when she first starts doing her job, it, she's literally writing verbatim what they mean. Well, not what they mean, but what they're saying and exactly how they're saying it in a very military way like writing a report and it's just weird how you can see the her progress throughout the entire story and i think it's only in like it's the first season's only 13 episodes 13 episodes well 13 episodes there's also a special and also a movie and 
as soon as this recording session's over, I'm watching this goddamn movie. <laughs> and it's the case of episode, yeah, episode na- eight and nine is when it's the full flashback where you see how everything happened and the final battle leading up to it. What the major asked Hodgson to do if anything happened and what happened after the war like he wanted violet to be looked after he didn't want her to continue this life mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you see the file back you see her lose her arms and even when losing her arms she's showing no signs of pain and she's still wanting to save the major who's been shot in the eye uh been sh- i think gut shot and she's still trying to get him out and even when the enemy is bombarding their own base because they know it's going to get taken over, so they'd rather destroy it than let the army have it. All she cares about is getting the major to safety. She doesn't give a fuck about herself. No. Probably probably because he was the only thing she cared about. And because she was taught to use herself, use her body to win no matter what, when she thought of, I want to save the major no matter what, she just didn't care about herself. Like she, she was like one track mind. And the major, on the other hand, was like, No, you save yourself. It's like, Oh, you both want to save each other, but only one of you lived. Oh. It was kind of like heart wrenching because I knew what was happening, <laughs> I knew what was going to happen. The major's going to die. <laughs> And the entire time, she, up until finding out in, also, I think it's episode eight when she fully finds out as well, she assumes that the Major's just away doing something and will give her an order at some point. So during this time, she's just working as a doll at this, I can't remember the name of the postage company, but that's what she's doing in her time and learning how to do stuff. But also doing what she's doing, she becomes one of the, most famous dolls in her profession. Which was surprising because of the way she first started, right? I mean, her first assignment was to make a type of love letter for this woman. And this woman is literally kind of venting to her. Mm -hmm. And she's expecting Violet to interpret it and make it flowery. (laughs) And she... Did not proofread what Violet wrote because she had full faith in Violet. And then when her client realized what was actually written and the guy who received the letter was upset, Violet was like, why are you upset? You told me to write this. And it's like, girl, you got a long way to go. (laughs) Holy cannoli. But. It also showed that all the people that are going to these doll, well, some of the people that are going to these dolls, what they're saying is not what they mean. Like the woman that she writes the letter for, who says this guy likes her, but she doesn't reciprocate the feelings. Maybe if he tried harder or had some more money, she'd be interested in and all that. But it turned out she did like the guy. She was interested, but wanted to play hard to get. <laughs> and Violet's just like, why didn't you say that then? <laughs> like she's, right? <laughs> she's taking what you say and she's writing verbatim what you say, not what you mean. And during her progression as a doll, she learns to interpret. And I think one of the best ways she does that is when she writes a letter for Lucullia, who is her schoolmate when she goes to the doll school and writes a letter for her brother which is i'm happy you're alive it's just a short and sweet letter that helps lakuli's brother who's an alcoholic who blames himself for their parents death sort himself out and that's the start of her journey of learning how to do her job but she, while doing so she also is slowly learning that she can feel stuff, that she does feel regret for what she did during the war. She knows that what she did was... I I can't say wrong because it's... She knows what she did and she knows the action she took. She knows she killed people. And what Hodgson says to her at the very beginning is, you're burning. 
you're burned with scars and one day you'll figure out what I mean. And she finds out what that's all about. And you see a scene of her on a ferry when she's returning back to the post office where she's just crying and she says, I am burning. And it's just a sad moment where she's finally letting these guards down and letting herself feel. It's interesting that normally when we see like manga or anime featuring female characters that have a hard time figuring out their feelings or addressing them and they kind of shut down and they're like, I don't have any feelings. I don't feel anything or I don't have any empathy. There's usually someone who helps them open their heart, help them realize what their emotions are or let them put down their guard. But with Violet, it's just her experiences that help her bring down her guard. And with those experiences, she meets different types of people. And most of the people who meet her at first who are emotional, they get frustrated that she doesn't understand. They're frustrated that she doesn't know what feelings are or they can't or she or Violet can't interpret. But as she spends time with them more or gets to know them better she's like oh now i understand and she finds more instances in her life that's like related to that emotion she's like oh so that's what happened so i was picturing that episode where she goes to her co-worker's village and that co-worker she is from like a remote village oh uh iris yeah iris iris she went to iris's village so when we first meet iris she's I, I want to say she's she's very not arrogant. She's a little full of herself. Yeah, she's she's a little full of herself. She thinks she's better than Violet, and she thinks Violet doesn't deserve to be an auto memory doll. But as they work together, they get closer, and then uh, Iris has to visit home, and I and Violet goes with her. And Due to Iris having an accident and tripping and. Damaged in her arm. <laughs> and so Iris did not have a good view of Violet at all. At all. Because Iris came from like a small village. She was so proud to go to the city and becoming an auto memory doll. Like when she visits, she's like, hum, hum, hum. I have this position. I am important. I am needed. And this person that she doesn't like got the same position. So she's like, well, I'm still better than Violet. But as they're spending time with each other at Iris's village, she gets to know Violet better. She's like, you know, she's not that bad. <clears throat> she's a little weird. Emotionally detached she is. But she uh, she means well. <laughs> and then Violet gets to know Iris better too because I'm pretty sure Violet is like viewing Iris sort of like a soldier or a scientific person. Like, this is a woman. She is arrogant. She doesn't like me. She likes to yell at me, kind of thing. <clears throat> but then she learns compassion for Iris. And I like that episode because Iris just hated her so much. All because Violet frustrated her. You do see something nice at the end of this is where Iris has Violet to write a letter for her. Mm -hmm. And she even tells her, it's a good letter. And then I think that's the first time anyone had told Violet that she's written a good letter. But Iris was also lying to her family <laughs> as well, saying that, oh, she's the best doll in all of Linden. <laughs> but, and her family also got there under false pretenses, like, we're going to throw you a birthday party, and then we're going to invite all these people here because you're old enough and you need to get married and have babies. Oh, Yeah. And Iris didn't want that. She didn't want to live that life. No, and also didn't want that guy being invited to a birthday party, the one she confessed feelings to, who rejected her. Ooh, burn. Burn. And her... <laughs> she asked Violet not to invite this one person, and <laughs> Violet ended up going to the mother and confirming if that person should be taken off the guest list, and... They said no, so he still got invited. She was just doing her job. She oh, didn't know the different context of different things. She was just, this is what I've been told to do, so I have to do it. She, as she still got that 
military mindset. Oh, man. I liked her military mindset. It just... <laughs> it sort of reminded me of... Uh, have you ever seen the show NCIS? That mystery... Uh, Navy mystery show? Oh, Navy Crime Investigation Squad, isn't it? Yeah. But, yeah, I, I've never been a huge fan of like NCIS or CSI, but I have watched it. Okay, so there's um there's a there's a character named Zeba and she had that military mindset too. She also had that language barrier also. So like when people had like sayings or phrases, she took it like literally. That's what like, it meant, but it actually meant something else. So Violet kind of reminded me of that character. I was like, ooh, I totally know what's going on with this girl. <laughs> she doesn't understand. <laughs> she can't read between the lines, even though she can type the lines. <laughs> Oh, but besides that, um, it brought humor because it was funny. Uh, the She's meme. taking everything at face value. <laughs> right, right. And I can relate to that because sometimes people tell me stuff. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. And then later on, they ask me, like, why did you do that? Like, because you said that. Did I do something wrong? And they're like, yeah, I didn't mean it like that. I was like, well, I didn't know that. Like, you're supposed to know that. You're supposed to know me. I'm like, well, sometimes I don't. <laughs> I'm like, I can relate to Violet. <laughs> I'm not a mind reader, okay? <laughs> uh but those times where Violet is taking things at face value, creating awkward moments like with Iris and that guy. Oh, my gosh. That was so funny. But also super awkward. Like, I was feeling Iris's shame and awkwardness. It's like, ooh, Iris, just tough it out. Tough it out, girl. You can do it. And then you also have the more heart-wrenching scenes that are in that show when she went to the battlefield against well it wasn't really against orders but Hodgson didn't want to send any of the dolls to the battlefield because he didn't want to risk any of their lives and she went anyway without letting them know and one of the soldiers she ended up helping write letters for who got injured and was dying in that shed well cottage and he wanted to write letters to his parents and childhood sweetheart. And as he's laying there dying, he's like, I want to say this, I want to say that. And Violet's like, anything else you want to say? And then he's just there like, just hold my hand, please. And he passes away and she makes sure she writes those letters and she hand delivers them. And as the parents are crying, obviously, and this, the girl that he loved also crying, they go to Violet and say thank you for bringing him back. And she's just finally breaks down and starts crying because she didn't save him. She couldn't protect him. And she's apologizing for something which she can't, she couldn't have done anyway. But she took it really personally. That was one of the best scenes in the anime where you got to see that side of her. Like she's still taking shit to heart. Which is showing her progress because. She was so emotionally detached before. The and only time you really see the show emotion was when anything involved the major. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So even though that she's crying, she's sort of in pain, you're, you're kind of happy for that because she's blossoming. It's like, yay, you're moving forward. Keep feeling stuff. Keep crying experience more go violet be free well you say be free but want her last orders be free and don't die mm -hmm. then we'll get to the episode that made me ball like a little baby where she gets hired to go to this woman's house for seven days and write letters for this a woman and she's very sick and you can tell and she's got a little daughter and when she sees violet she think she's an actual doll <laughs> and then she's wait she can talk she can drink and then sees her mechanical hands and she's like oh she really is a doll <laughs> as the mother's ill 
she asks the daughter to look after Violet and keep her entertained. And she's like, oh, well, okay, we can do this, 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 this. Uh, we can play house. We can catch bugs. We can do this. And f- thinking, and the Violet's like, I'm sorry. And she's like, oh, it's not happening. Which, <laughs> which is the most important out of those? And we'll do them in that order. And so she's playing with this girl and also working with the mother to write these letters. And the girl ends up saying what she means. Like, I didn't want you to do this. I wanted, I, I wanted my mother to do it. And you're taking my time away from my mother and everything like that because she knows the mother's dying. And Violet is just like, I'm sorry. I can't let you know what the letters are for. It's, I need to do this, but I promise you, you will have time with your mother. And after all the things have done and everything like that, you see it cut to the mother's funeral. And then it's the birthday afterwards, and she gets a letter. And it's the mother saying happy birthday. And then it cuts to a couple of years later. And then this is the mother saying a happy birthday again. And it's like, oh, now you're 18. And, oh, you're 20, happy 20th, and everything like that. And it turns out the letters that the mother was writing was messages to give to a daughter on her birthday for the next 50 years. And you see Violet just bawling out, bawling her eyes out, saying she's gone and everything like that. And by the time she gets these letters, her mother's going to be dead. She's going to be alone and everything like that. And her co-workers are reassuring her, saying, look, her mother's not gone. She's going to be getting these for the next 50 years. She's going to get something from her mother, and you're the one who helped do this. You're the one who writ this down for her. You're going to make sure that her and her mother are together for all the time coming. And at that moment, moment the fucking waterworks started, and I just started crying. <laughs> that was just such a sweet episode. It was also heartbreaking. Yeah, they did have a lot of some, a lot of like relatable episodes. Like with that episode, I was thinking about my parents because they're much older, and I was thinking like, "Oh, what if that was me?" It's really meaningful through these episodes because we live in a time where we have a lot of technology and luxuries, and there are times where we take things for granted. And the way they set this period were the best type of communication or the best form of communication is through letters and people they want to write letters but through these through the dolls the dolls are able to make the letters more meaningful to convey the feelings and thoughts in a different way and then when the the clients they read it they're like this is exactly what i wanted to say like, they wanted to say it that way, but they didn't know how. Like that mother. She wanted to say stuff to her daughter, but she knew she was going to have time for it. She could have written letters in her own way, but she knew that she needed a doll to write it the right way. It also helped Violet collect, uh, connect with her emotions a lot more as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She was able to feel something. She, like She felt compassion towards the little girl and the fact that knowing that by the time she reads the first letter a mother's going to be long gone but with a co-worker is like no that this isn't the end of that you've done something that's gonna keep them connected for years to come it was it was a very beautiful scene where you saw that and how it was portrayed and I don't even know what genre that you class this as. Wouldn't it just would you call it, what was this be? Was it be a show, Joe? Mm. So I can't think of which genre that this is technically fall under. But I'm gonna when you see, up. yeah, I'm actually trying to think of what it'd be classed as. Nah. Coming of Age? Coming of Age is a genre of literature, film, and video that focuses on the growth of a protagonist from youth to adulthood. Coming of Age stories tend to emphasize dialogue or internal monologue over action and are often set in the past. 
Yeah, I can see it being coming of age. But we need the the <laughs> the usual genres that we <laughs> see. <laughs> this one's like literature to genre. <laughs> <laughs> this is like oh that's like pretty spot on but <laughs> podcast cross worlds episodes talking about different genres <laughs> 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 oh that that could be <laughs> uh in a world with podcasts and different genres <laughs> Uh, let's see. Slice of life. Yeah, I can see slice of life in it. Yeah, I was thinking more like slice of life because we were seeing. Actually, we were seeing her life and different mm. aspects were really important in her growth. So, yeah, I can see like signing coming of age, slice of life. Yeah, basically the growth of the protagonist. Okay. Next topic. All right. Did you see that episode where uh she was writing um letters for that girl, a princess? Oh, the princess to the prince because yeah, she didn't know what to say, and it had to be a public letter, a love letter. Right. Which I thought that was weird. I was like, why are you guys making these letters public? Are you trying to like build like like kingdom morale or something like? I think it's I think it's because this was after the war and these two um territories were not the best on terms I guess and they were trying to like yes let's let's unite let's be together let's use our was it political figures to show us how to do it if they can do it so can you and the princess is all, I don't want to do this. I don't want to. And he's older than me and everything. It turns out, no, she does love him. You've just been a little brat about it. <laughs> and yeah. then it also turns out you had another one of the dolls from the same company working with the prince to write the letters. I liked how Violet noticed that. She's like, wait a minute. This type of writing looks familiar. And she's like, hold on. And she went to visit that doll she's <laughs> and then they set something up i was like oh i didn't expect this and the work together to set up the prince meeting the princess in the garden under the moonlight so he could actually ask her to marry him it was cute it was one of those uh romance novels kind of thing oh yeah that episode compared to the others that was romance yeah that was I that was shoujo. Yep. <laughs> that, that was one of the cutesy episodes, which were far and few between. Yeah. You never had many straight up nice episodes. Like even the episode where she was helping the author write a play, that was kind of dark as well, where it turned out it was his daughter died because she had, it looked like she had cancer. And how he was helping her and just trying to look after his daughter because also the mother had passed away. And he wanted to finish a story that he told his daughter. And Violet's like, oh, we can do this, we can do that. And he, she, Violet reminds him of his daughter as well. And she just I wants to... And he's telling this story, which is for kids. And because Violet herself is very... I would say she's very childish but not behavior wise but she has the mind of a child because she was never able to grow up fully because of what she went through and so as she is telling her this story and this stage play she's like so what happens next we need to figure this out she needs to get safe and everything like that like she's really invested in this story which is surprising because you didn't really see her get that excited for someone else's story before you only saw her like okay i'm gonna write this it was nice seeing a lighter side of Violet because you normally just see the monotone side and the emotionally scarred side of her. And being able to see her have feelings, like excitement and wonder, it was a nice change of pace because you are seeing a three-dimensional character. You're getting to learn more about them. You are seeing the growth of a character. 
I would say I appreciate what the author's done, how he's written these characters. Like, none of them are really archetypes. Like, you'll see a character a certain way, and then it's like, no, it's not that, it's this. I've, like, Violet, you see her as war torn. She's going to be emotionally damaged. She's going to be like this. And it's going to be like the movie Soldier. But you get to see other sides, and it's like, you see wonder in her, you see happiness in her, you see sadness in her. And how it all builds upon this one character, not just this one character. Like, you see Hodgson, who was a, a high up in the army, but it wasn't due to his own merit. It was due to the fact that his family was huge benefactors to the army. So they put him in positions where he'd get promoted and keep him out of danger. It, he, so he started this, he left the military as soon as the war was over so he could start a company. And it just so happened that it was a delivery a postal company that also hired dolls to write letters for people. And she see different sides of some of the dolls. Like one of the dolls thinks that she's not capable of being a doll, but all she wants to do is write letters that connect people. You see Iris, who has a superiority complex at the beginning. But you get to see her soften and become a nice character and become one of Violet's friends and who genuinely cares for her. Just how each of these characters are written is just so well and suits this world that the author has built. Just everything just fits together so nicely. I, I don't have many bad things to say about the show. And it's an easy recommendation. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. need to watch this show. <laughs> I first saw this show because I saw the art style and I was thinking, huh, this is really nice. And the way the art style looked, I knew it wasn't going to be too cutesy. And I read the summary. I was like, huh, this sounds interesting. And I'm watching it and I'm like, oh my, she lost two arms. What? What, 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 what is she going to do? Like, how is this going to work out? And then I see her working in the post office and then she's doing like, you know, organizing work. And then she she says she wants to be a doll because she wants to learn how to feel. And I'm like, why does she want to learn how to feel? How How is she going to do that? How is she going to learn how to feel by writing letters? Like, girl, how are you going to do this if you don't have feelings? And then I just see her progress. I'm like, oh, I'm so happy for her. <laughs> well, I initially wrote the show off because I didn't even read the summary. I just saw the cover art for it. And I was like, this isn't going to be for me. <laughs> but I think it is when it's come to like the episode of recording, Paul, like it'll be my idea, who was the idea. So we decide who does it. And she, I was like, and it was a case of it's time to discuss an anime. And who would you send me a message saying, how about this? And I've never seen it. And then I watched it, and it's kind of like a thank you, thank you for recommending the show, but fuck you for making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> and all I can say is, don't let the if you just see the artwork like I did, and you just see what looks like to be a Victorian period drama, don't go on that. It's so much more, and it is a, it is something that needs to be watched, even if you don't like this sort of thing. The emotional roller coaster and how it treats characters. I believe this is going to be a classic anime. It's, I hope so. Oh, I guarantee it is. It's got everything that you need in a well written show. It's got character development. It's got, it's not one tone. You don't have just one thing to be like, oh, this is just going to be sh sh like you get, oh, this one's just going to be shown and this one's just going to be horror. This one's going to just be this. This one does what it needs to do to be able to tell the story. It grows. It's not a trope like you get with so many different shows out there. It's not trying to be something it's not. Like you'll get some shows out there that do some just for the sake of doing it. Like there's nothing wrong with those. Like you do get some fan service shows that are just fan service for the sake of fan service. And those can be funny as fuck. And those can be good. But then you get some shows that are like oh, we're going to just throw in a load of shown moments just for the sake of it, because we know that genre is popular and it doesn't need it. But this one 
isn't like that. It's not following a trend. It's not trying to do anything just for the sake of doing it. It does what it needs to do to progress the story. And the way it is written, and the pacing can be a little slow. I will say that. But as it goes on and everything like that, and you get to learn more about the way the world is and every, and how it all progresses, the way this actual show culminates, I can't fault it. And the fact that I'm having to say the pacing is a little off, that's me being really fucking nitpicky. <laughs> I'm having I'm having to reach into thin air and just pull something I'm thinking of like, uh, what if I had to say something bad, what would I say? And it's that. I, that is a nitpick. And the fact that I'm thinking that, yeah, this is an amazing show. People need to watch it. Even wanna... if you don't like anime, you need to watch it. <laughs> I want to say it's underrated. It's underrated. I don't I don't hear many people talking about this story. I don't. Maybe I'm not looking in the right places. But I, I do like stories where it's like set in the past because it's in a situation that I'm not familiar with. Like, for example, they're using typewriters and their former communications through letters. I'm like, how are you going to do that? Like, And it was focusing on letters, writing letters. It's like one of those like Jane Eyre <laughs> like stories where like the female protagonist is writing a letter to like the male lead. <laughs> hey, Mr. Darcy. <laughs> I hate yeah. you. You are so rude. <laughs> but in a but in a flowery way. <laughs> yeah. That just vex me. But yeah, it, that's why I originally didn't watch it because like I say, just looking at the cover, I thought this is gonna be a period drama. <laughs> so I just rolled it off. Yeah, so when they did show the the war scenes and it got gory, like you're seeing people dying you were seeing blood spatters you saw her losing her arms like through bombs like the enemy was like throwing grenades and boom yeah first one was Arm shot gone. through a rifle <laughs> and the second one was due to a uh, a stick granata which is a stick grenade but and then it wasn't just falling off you just saw like a sleeve and then all of a sudden her sleeve just went in on itself and it just turned out her arm fell off it was like, holy shit! Like, and I was like, oh, I'm more familiar with this kind of anime. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those, it wasn't violent for the sake of being violent. No, no, it wasn't. It was just showing, oh, I want to say it was showing what it was like in the war for her. Like, that was realistic stuff. Mm. Like, that stuff happens in real life. That's what happens mm. in war, in battles. It was showing was fucked up and it needed to show it. It needed to show why she was damaged the way she was. It wasn't going to be all... <laughs> it wasn't going to sugarcoat it at all. Mm -mm. It, it needed to show the extremity of war. So you got to see the violence, the bloodshed, the death in war. And that helped contrast to her life now. And even show like the major's brother who... Started off, he was a total ass. Yep, he was a butthead. Mm -hmm. And towards the end, he got to see who Violet was now. Well, I think it was because he had like a prejudice against her. Oh, yeah, he did. He also even said that he blamed Violet for his brother's death. And then when he realized how um, distraught, how heartbroken she was that the major was gone, that's when I guess. He felt more related to her, a little bit uh, more compassion. I'd say that was more when she saved his life, where she jumped in front of bullets for him. And the fact she also like jumped off the train was like, okay, I need to get rid of this bomb to stop everyone dying. She gave up murder. She gave up killing people, and she was a completely different person. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why I was so captivated with Violet Evergarden. I. Well, that's not the right thing. I, I'm trying to figure out why I was so captivated with Violet Evergarden. Because if you really think about it, she was just a scarred girl. And she's, she's trying to understand emotions. And that's a selfish thing of hers. It's the only selfish thing she's ever had so far. And somehow every episode was captivating. 
just like her little struggles of like trying to understand what people are saying. Like when she's writing letters for them, like she knows that they want her to convey it in mm-hmm. a beautiful way. And she's she herself is struggling. She she kind of knows how to do it. Like she's got a pattern. She's like, okay, I know what to do, but I need more information. So when they're telling her what to write and she hits a part where she's like, I don't understand this. And she asks them, she's like, what do you mean by that? Can you tell me more? And then they're like struggling to to explain it to her. And then she's asking or inquiring more. It's like, well, tell me a moment that this happened. Like, why are you trying to say this to this person? And then she's making them remember. And you're like, oh, it's because of this. And they're they're telling the story. She's like, ah, I get it now. Okay. And then she's like typing along. She's typing some more. She's like, da, 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 da. The way she talks, you would think that she's like, this monotone bitch. <laughs> like, she got no emotion. She sounds dead. But you, <laughs> you like her. <laughs> <laughs> if you really think about it. <laughs> She does end up changing the lives of everyone she meets. I think one of the most extreme ways she does it is when she's working. Is it a library? Oh, at the um with the scholars, and yeah. she kind of befriends with that that boy. Yeah, the one who was also had a bad childhood. Yeah, I think and... she. I think she's um um rewriting the old books before they disintegrate. Mm-hmm. And they're deciphering it, and she's typing, and she's able to keep up with exactly as quick as he's talking. And the moment where he finds out, like the emotional side, like he doesn't feel emotions that much, and she's like, "Oh, so you're just like me?" Well, I know why he was like that because he was sort of like on a scholarship. He was from a poor family, um, and he was. He was just there to study. He was there on a mission. He was determined. And all his, a lot of his peers were, they were kind of viewing down on him and kind of causing him trouble. His father disappeared when he was younger because he went out to find some old manuscripts. And after so long, they, after two years, they gave up the search for him. Then his mother went off to try and find the father, and she went missing. And as he was at the library studying and everything like that, he said when he was speaking to Violet uh, while they were looking at Ali's comet that he was there because just in case they ever came back. And that's why he kept studying and doing his work. But after meeting Violet, he's like, I don't need to stop here. I want to go out and I want to discover stuff myself. And in the last episode, you see him on an an expedition in the mountains. So he finally followed his dream and did what he needed to to do. In her own little way, she was able to inspire him. And that's what she did. And in throughout these 13 episodes, yeah, this this season was only 13 episodes. A lot happened. A lot. They crammed a lot into how short it was. I'm pretty sure if they could, if they did, if they did more episodes, they would have probably did more episodes about the other characters because I'm curious about the number one doll because there was that scene between between Catalea and Hodgins where Catalea's like, so are we going to be together tonight? And Hodgins like, no, nah, I have to be at home with my wife and kids. She's like, oh, and I'm thinking, oh, wait, hold up. What? What? Wait, wait, wait. Was Hodgins serious when he said he had a wife of kids or was she just brushing her off? And I was thinking, OK, how long have they known each other? All right. How long have they been in this uh, complicated relationship? What is it called? Not categorized, not labeled relationship. How long have they been in this? And I was like thinking, this would be another good episode. An episode about how they met and how they got together. You know, how their relationship progressed to this post office. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it's not necessary. But 
it would have been interesting. It would have been interesting. Were there any characters that you were um, curious about? I wanted to know more about the old guy who worked as a postman. When Violet herself was going through the fallout of knowing that Major had died and she wouldn't come out of her room, and he goes down and goes, oh, I've got a letter, f- letter for you. And she reads it, and it, it's just after they've recovered a load of letters that had been discarded. And he's speaking to her and like, oh, well, do you want to help me deliver them? You go down that way, I'll go down this way, and we'll deliver them all. And comes back and says, well, every letter has a home, and it needs to be delivered. And he's explaining all this to her, like, yeah, the letters are important. People get great joy after being able to read them. And it also helps Violet get to the point where she opens up her own letter, which is the first letter she had ever received. And Aww. I think there's more to the old guy. When you first meet him, he just wants to... He just seems like the office oaf. <laughs> <laughs> but that scene was a very poignant moment. And I do believe there is more to him, and I would like to learn more about that character. And I'd also like to learn more about Deep Freed as well, Major Gilbert's brother. Because yeah. the f- first time he seems like, or find out about him, he's just like, oh, here's this discarded tool, you use it. I'd like to know more about his backstory. Like how he became so cynical and a bit of a cunt. <laughs> you know, um when I saw um Major Gilbert's brother, I was blown away by how much they look alike. I was like, whoa. Whoa. I think that was on purpose, so every time that she saw him, she saw the major first and then saw Deep Freed. But I'd like to learn more about his backstory because there's gotta be a moment where it became like that. Where right? he became someone you see as being evil i am curious about deep free too because anyone who gets cynical like that and an asshole someone hurt them in the past someone hurt them and i want to know i want to know when and where and who gave you pain (laughs) actually it could have been different instances because um they're they're like aristocrats right so it's probably like that whole like class pressure and like family and the country and then being like the head of the family being the next head of the family like there's so many factors but i want to know the details well you get to see the complete difference when you meet the mother because she seemed like a very sweet woman in complete contrast to who he is Mm -hmm. so that's why i feel like there's got to be more there blame their dad Blame their dad. <laughs> Dad's fault. <laughs> speculating here. Yeah. Disclaimer, speculating. Daddy. Daddy wasn't there. <laughs> oh. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, need season two now. <laughs> More like a movie. Give us the movie now. <laughs> I did see the cover of of that video of oh, that video of that movie and it had Gilbert in it, I think. They had like the backside of Gilbert. I think it was Gilbert. And I'm thinking, what? What is this gonna be about? I mm, mm, better be good. Just saying. What if it's like an alternate ending? What if Major what? Gilbert survived? What, the movie? Yeah. Well, it does say the movie's standalone. Hmm. And I know that it says the OVA is set between episode four and five. Hmm. Hmm. So y'all who are listening to this, you know, watch the episodes. It's only 13, and the OVA that's coming now is between episodes four and five. Oh, the so OVA, catch up to- OVA is out. It's on Netflix already. Yep, yep. So catch up at least to episode five. <laughs> if you have Netflix already, it's not hard. Just click on and watch. Binge watch. 
I think that's what happened to me. I binge watched it. <laughs> I was like, I was, it was late at night. I was like, ooh, what's this? Watched it. I was like, I need to know what happens next. <laughs> I need to know what happens next. And next thing I know, I watched the whole season. And I was like, that's it? <laughs> but I was satisfied with the ending. There are some shows where I'm like, no, I need to know more. <laughs> but this one, I was satisfied with it. And the poor question is... <laughs> The Paul question for this episode is What is your favorite genre? Let us know in the comments if the platform allows it. If not, there is a Discord. Click on the Discord link in the description. There is the Paul question. Read it and answer in whatever designated era you want. Hashtag anime or manga. I'm Lehua Superfina, host of Podcasts Across Worlds. You can find me on all social media platforms at Lehua Superfina. Weekly, I upload videos about video games, manga, and candy masks on youtube.com slash Lehua Superfina. I also stream every Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays on twitch.tv slash Lehua Superfina. Hi, I'm Spirit Shop, co-host of Podcast Records World and also content creator, streamer on the channel you'll find in the description. And um, one of the upcoming shows is Tinfoil Talks where we deep dive into bullshit in video gaming. We take a topic and we find out how it got there, why it's there, come up with some excuse until we believe it ourselves, and then put it out into the stratosphere. And that concludes our episode of Podcasts Across Worlds. Thank you all for tuning in. Keep reading manga, keep watching anime, and keep listening to Podcasts Across Worlds. We'll see you on the next episode. Since you're still here... How about leaving a like? And while you're at it, subscribe, ring the bell so you can get notifications. I want to give a huge, huge shout out to my Patreons and channel members because you all have been supporting the Superfina channel and it's not even required. So I really appreciate you. You are all in my heart. If you also want to support the Superfina channel, here's a link to the Patreon along with a list of social media. All the links are available in the description below. Thank you so much for watching this video. I have much love, much aloha for y'all, and I will see you later.